Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Jesus 911, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, two man car. We are 10 8, Jesse Romero and Ruben Nava. Batman and Ruben. Hey, Jesse, uh, good morning. Reporting for duty, sir. You know, Jess, I just want to, um, hey, if we could, uh, 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 a listener of the show and a good one of my best friends, his uh, his son's also in the sheriff's department, and um, he, he was, uh, he's been quarantined. He was just exposed to a, another deputy that has been tested positive, and so uh, he's been quarantined, and he, he may have, uh, you know, he had contact with his wife and kids, and so we're, we're lifting him up in his prayers. John, Johnny Roof, uh, it's Junior, John Roof Junior. His, uh, you know, this this virus is taking a, a toll on many of our first responders. So uh, let's uh, have our, you know, if our listeners could keep him in our prayers, keep the family in the prayers, and all those people that are are on the front lines that are being exposed to this virus that's uh, so contagious. Um, we asked uh, intervention from our Lord and Our Lady. That they would uh, heal them, and especially the uh, all the uh, symptoms and and the anxiety that goes along with it, you know. And uh, Amen. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on them, Lord, and just bring full healing to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And let's be with spiritual communion and pray, Reuben, for everybody, everybody that's uh, self quarantined. <clears throat> name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm-hmm. My Jesus, I believe that thou art present in the most blessed sacrament. I love thee above all things, and I desire to possess thee within my soul. Since I am unable now to receive thee sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace these being already there, and I unite myself wholly and entirely to thee. Amen. Name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's very important just to unite ourselves every single day. Even when when we're off, uh, when this is over with, it will be over with one day. Yes. Uh. We have to, every single day, we've got to unite ourselves to Jesus. And if you can't get to Mass every day, which a lot of people can't, I get it. Um, that's a prayer that's been practiced for centuries and centuries in the Catholic Church. There's modified forms of it. It's just called spiritual communion with Jesus. Just go on the website and just uh, pick one out and, and memorize it. Put it on your phone and memorize it and do it for the rest of your life. It's a good way to start your day. Uniting yourself spiritually with Jesus Christ calling jesus into your heart every day spiritually in communion uh this comes from oh back back uh saint alphonsus Liguori. he's yeah. the one that gave us this prayer exactly Ruben, let's talk about something very interesting let's make some and we i've never we've never done this before and i thought it was just time to do it right now because right now <clears throat> president trump is just taking so much so much flack and fire for, for the mainstream media that hasn't stopped in four years but i want to do a comparison because a lot of people will say, man, how can you guys get behind such a flawed individual? I'll say, well, you know what? Guilty right here. Myself, Ruben, we're, yeah. we're flawed individuals. Yep, we're sinners. Uh, a sinful past. We still struggle with sin right now. And last time I saw the Bible, it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Amen. God. But, Ruben, we want to make a comparison between uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, and some other leaders in the past uh, who were flawed individuals as well. And yet God can do great things through them. Absolutely. So who's the first guy we want to talk about? Uh, is uh, Cyrus. You know, so, um, you know, the the article talks about, uh, you know, it's comparing Donald Trump with, with uh, Cyrus, who's mentioned in Scripture. So uh, let's just get into it. And it says, uh, ever since Donald Trump became a, uh, to surge as a, as a candidate, um, this, was, this article is also a few years old, but it's, yeah. It's right when he was running for office. Christians have been pointing to the book of Isaiah and comparing Trump with the ancient Persian king Cyrus. Some have even claimed that God has revealed to them that he will use Trump for the good of America, just as he used Cyrus for the good of the Jewish people, even though Cyrus was a pagan king. So could this be true? And so we look at the the biblical and the ancient Near East uh, evidence. Um, Cyrus, whose name uh, was pronounced Koresh in in, uh, Hebrew, became King of Persia in 559 B.C. and conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. He's mentioned in a majestic passage in, in the book of Isaiah where the Lord says of Cyrus, quote, He is my shepherd and he shall fulfill my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built 
and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Isaiah forty four twenty eight. Let and me just mention one thing right there, Ruben, that what you just shared. Uh, at this point, just remember the context. <clears throat> the Jews or the Israelites, they were prisoners to Babylon, <clears throat> and uh, and Cyrus, uh, who was the king of Persia, came and defeated Babylon in war and liberated the Jews. Right. So that's uh, that, that's that's kind of the the. The historical context here. All right, go ahead. And so, and oh, just so people know, Babylon's—it's the most famous city in Mesopotamia. Who, you know, it's uh, ruins lie in modern-day Iraq, like fifty mi- fifty-nine miles uh, southwest of Baghdad. So, just to give you, uh, you know, a perspective on where it is, we're talking about uh, Iraq, and um, it's also the names thought to derive from uh, from the Akkadian language, which meant uh, "gate of God" or "gate of the gods." And Babylon coming from Greek. So, in other words, Cyrus was going to be the one who would cause Jerusalem to rebuild after it had been destroyed decades earlier by the Babylonians. I mean, the whole, you know, uh, salvation history is these God's people being destroyed and overtaken by so many different um, nations yeah. and empires, right? right yeah. But there's right. one. There's more than that, than that. Isaiah says that Cyrus, as the prophecy continues in chapter forty-five. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the iron, the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you have known. That is, I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name, for the sake of you, my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. Isaiah. 4. That's important, though. <laughs> you got to say about Cyrus. I'm going to call you to help me out, even though you don't know me. Yeah. That's amazing right there. Reuben just read Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 to 4. And if you read um, verse 5 and 6, it really it says, you know, that I, five, verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there's no other besides me. There is no God. I am, I arm you, though you do not know me. Again, he says that. So that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. You know, God's putting it out there. He's So, so what's going on here? We got... Cyrus, a, a pagan, a non-Israelite king who worships false gods, and uh, he he came into Babylon, defeated the Babylonians, let the Jews, uh, he, instead of taking them prisoners, he let them free. And Isaiah is calling him prophetically God's anointed. Mm-hmm. God, that's a term elsewhere that's only used for Israelite leaders. So the Bible's calling a pagan king God's anointed, God's Christ. Right. So uh Cyrus although although called by the God of Israel, he doesn't actually know the God of Israel, as the Bible says. Instead, like the vast majority of people in the ancient world, he worshiped different deities in the form of idols. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verse 23. This is uh in in fulfillment of the prophecies that Reuben just read. The scriptures record how Cyrus made this law, this decree to the Jewish people living in Babylon, where they had been taken uh, in exile as prisoners. Here's what 2 Chronicles 36, 23 says, quote, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build them a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So check this out. So a pagan king, and this is all being done. Obviously, God is doing all this. God is moving his heart to do all this. So a pagan king encourages the the captured Jewish people, now liberated, to return to their homeland, Jerusalem, in the, in the country of Israel, and rebuild their temple. And this pagan king even helped fund the endeavor. He was the guy that was financing this. Talk about God using, I mean, a, a flawed individual. That's the whole point that we're making here. We're making the uh, the Cyrus, the Persian king, and Donald Trump connection that God can use flawed individuals. But Cyrus did not only do this for the people of Israel. This kind of became a standard Persian policy. 
allowing exiles to return to their homelands and rebuild their temples as the subjects of the Persian Empire. So Cyrus was known to do this to other people as well. And we know this from a famous uh, archaeological writing. It's called Cyrus Cylinder that was discovered in 1879. It, it reads there, it says, quote, that Marduk, the chief god of the Babylonians, pantheon, and, and, and called the king of the gods in the, in the text, took the hand of Cyrus, who called him by his name, proclaiming him aloud for the kingship over all of everything. So even this, this pagan document talks about uh, Cyrus being used by the gods. And we also read in the text that Cyrus restored the various idol temples in his empire, which gives further confirmation to the biblical account. Uh, so here it is, Marduk, this false god who's given credit for the reign of Cyrus in the Bible, it's Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the only true God who takes the credit. And obviously, Cyrus did not even know him, just as Isaiah said. And this comports with what the Catechism says in paragraph 600, that God can use sinful men, and God can still weave his plan of salvation through their sinful actions by God's permissive will. Reuben? Yeah. And, you know, I did a word study on on the anointed people, you know, and... Uh, we're gonna we'll we'll pick it up on the other side of the break, but it's a, it, just so that you can get the the you can grasp what God, who God's really referring to when He says anointed. You know uh, some of the the Hall of Fame pe- names that come up when that God is called anointed. When we come back. Nine one one. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female he created them. According to Pope St. John XXIII, it is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in his image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. How does the baby eat? Can the baby hear me? How did the baby get in there? Wow, a pregnancy can sure generate a lot of questions. But what's important is that a baby is a baby, inside and out of the womb. Not just after birth, but nine months before, at conception. That's right, every baby is a miracle. Hello, my name is Marianne Kuharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org or better yet, simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the keyword pro-life. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. A baby's heart is beating 18 days from conception. Pro-Life Across America. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Jesus 911, we're back. The question of the day is Is Donald Trump the modern day Cyrus? That's what we're getting into today. We're comparing. I think he is. I think we're making the case. Yep. Uh, God, God calls him the anointed one. And, and so when I did a re- word search on anointed, you know, for example, uh, King David was was called anointed. You know, he's often described in the Old Testament as God's anointed one. Psalm twenty eight. David's also used 
a similar expression, the Lord's uh, the Lord's anointed to describe King Saul on a number of occasions, 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 6. And King Solomon, David's son, used the same expression to refer to himself in 2 Chronicles 6, 42. So that's, uh, that's, a, you know, that's a Hall of Fame list of names right there. And, um, and ultimately, you know, the, the, ultimately, the ultimate it's, anointed it's is Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, the Son of God. That's, yeah, that's who we're all... The world, uh, uh, all all these are precursors of the of the perfect anointed one who is Christ, because they're all flawed anointed ones, Reuben. Yes. Yeah, and Jesus is the, the perfection par excellence. But let's continue with this article as uh, uh, comparing Neb- uh, Cyrus the Persian king to, to Donald Trump. Okay. And so, um, as the saying goes, I think, um, okay, are you, yeah, as the saying goes, let God be God, meaning it's up to him to do what he wants to do. Only he can answer this question for sure. Or from a more secular perspective, only time will tell. What's clear, though, is that God did not raise up idol worshiping, uh, an idol worshiping king to rule the nation of Israel. That would have been a curse rather than a blessing. In contrast, Christians are talking about God raising up Trump to lead America, which would be very different than Cyrus being used to help the exiles return to Jerusalem and rebuild it. So that doesn't mean, of course, that Trump could not be a Cyrus type of figure. It simply means that. The parallel breaks down when applied, but there's another possibility to consider. There was another ancient king named Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian leader who decades before Cyrus became king. And he led his armies to destroy Jerusalem, burn down the temple, and send the Jewish people into exile in 586 uh, BC. He too was an idol worshiper, yet shockingly Yahweh calls him my servant, stating plainly, behold, I will send for all the tribes of of the north declares the Lord and for Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon my servant and I will bring them against this land meaning Judah and its uh, inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror a hissing and an everlasting desolation that's taken from Jeremiah 25 9 and um, so you know you can also look at Jeremiah 25 6 and Jeremiah 43 10 uh, like, like Jeremiah twenty five six says, do not go after other gods to serve. Twenty seven six. Twenty seven six. I'm sorry. Twenty seven six. Do not. Okay. Go other gods to worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Um, Jeremiah forty three ten says, and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant, and he will set his throne above the stones which I have hid, and he will spread his royal canopy over them. Uh, yeah, Jess. Go yeah, ahead. so so Cyrus was anointed by God to restore the Jewish people from captivity and to rebuild Jerusalem after King Nebuchadnezzar was used as the vessel of divine judgment. And he was called by God to send the Jewish people into exile and to destroy Jerusalem. So one wicked king was sent by God as the, as divine, as the vessel of divine judgment. And the other king, fallen king was uh, sent by God to restore the Jewish people from captivity. So you got two pagan kings, one raised up to bring judgment and the other raised up to bring restoration. So is Donald Trump a Cyrus or a Nebuchadnezzar, if either? Well, let God be God and only time will tell. But we'll we'll wait and watch and vote and act. And and let's not forget to pray that God has mercy upon America, especially for uh, at this time as we're going through this uh I prefer to call it the Wuhan virus. I think we, we deflect from the obvious when we say it's the coronavirus. It came from Wuhan, China. It's, it came from the communists. Whether by intention or by accident, it came from Wuhan, China. So I personally would be calling it the Wuhan virus. I don't want people to forget where it came from. It's a communist country virus. But uh, the one thing that we're sure of is that we're living in a very critical time in history right now. And, and let me just, just give you just a, a summary of what we just shared in this article. So Cyrus, this uh, great Persian king, uh, led the empire during the Jewish exile and captivity in Babylon. And the Bible is clear <clears throat> that Cyrus was, was not part of God's people. He was a pagan. But he received divine inspiration to issue an official decree that would have, that would have the temple in Jerusalem rebuilt and that the Jews would be sent back to the Holy Land for the repurpose of rebuilding God's house. So Cyrus was praised by God's people in the Old Testament to the point that the prophet Isaiah calls him 
the anointed of the Lord. In other words, he's a Messiah-like character mm. that would prefigure Christ himself. Now, again, Cyrus, just like Donald Trump, he was not a man of perfect virtue. He had multiple wives and concubines. Mm -hmm. Sounds like President Trump's past. He lived in luxury. Sounds like President Trump's past as well. And he conquered many nations and he built a great empire. Yet the good Lord used this flawed man to accomplish his divine plan for his holy people. Yeah. And having said that, I just want to mention, <clears throat> I got a new book. It's called Catholic Vote for Trump. Here it is, put out by 10 books. In fact, uh, it was the number one bestseller on Amazon for political books last week. I'm holding my but, copy up too, Jess. I started reading it. It's very good. <laughs> I thank the Lord for that. Uh, Ruben, the only thing I will say about Donald Trump, when people say, how can you, you know, write a book and, and defend him? You know, you're a Catholic. This guy's a flawed individual. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. Romans 3.23, buddy, mm -hmm. for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yep. Last time I checked, I was a sinner. I still go to confession. I know Ruben does. And any Catholic that has any rational thinking goes to confession as often as possible. Right. And so uh, if you're going to use the argument, how can you get behind a flat individual? I would just say, look at the mirror, my friend. That's right. But I, but I would say this, Ruben, about uh, President Trump. You know, I forget what president said that years ago. He says, you can tell a man by his enemies he keeps. Well, <laughs> Donald Trump has all the right enemies. Who hates him? Right. The liberal media, the the globalists, the the elites. Uh, the socialist, uh, Hollywood, uh, the New World Order proponents, academia, uh, witches, Satanists, Planned Parenthood. Everybody who hates Trump, guess what? They also hate Jesus, our Lord, and they also hate the Catholic Church. So all I could say, Ruben, is he keeps some pretty good enemies. That's right. You know, what's interesting is that uh, what Cyrus did to uh, to restore the the land to God's people and, and built, rebuild the temple. It, it's, it's interesting that, um, that Cyrus, uh, tried to improve the lives of the Babylonians and, 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 uh, Cyrus's efforts in repatriating displaced people and restoring temples across Mesopotamia and then letting them worship the God of their choice, not the God of, of the conqueror. Cause it tells the story of letting people living their lives even after their country was conquered, something that it was unheard of at that time. In the ancient world and many years to, to come, conquering a new land would mean owning and the land and its people. And so what I see is, uh, you know, Trump is, is helping to restore religious freedom, you know, mm -hmm. not just to Christians, but, you know, the Jews and the Muslims. And and um, he's, he's allowing us to be able to... Uh, you know, speak freely of, of, of our faith and, and, or just look at the, you know, the little sisters of the poor, you know, he, he was uh, all for them so that they wouldn't have to, uh, donate to, uh, uh abort of patients. And, uh, and so I see that he definitely is a, he, he definitely is a Cyrus, the great King like figure. Yes. Without a doubt. I mean, there's a, there's a strong parallel there. Right. He's yeah, he's he, I think he's uh like you said he's not he's not a perfect man. We none of us are. But he, he you know, he's been chosen for this time that you know it's we're, we're supposed to uh you know honor our leaders and you know as long as they're not we're not they're not leading us into sin that we couldn't we couldn't follow them if they were having us right. commit mortal sin. You know. You know j j just uh you know I forget the the passage uh, exactly but remember even uh in the uh, the book of Acts, I believe it was uh, Gamaliel. I know it's in the book of Acts, but in um, Gamaliel, you know, was the Pharisee doctor of the Jewish law. And he, he encouraged his fellow Pharisees to show leniency to the apostles in, in Jesus in Acts in five thirty four, and uh, Jewish um, and and the Jewish law teacher of Paul, you know, Saint Paul the apostle in Acts twenty two three. I, I I I forget how exactly that verse goes, but he he was basically saying, if you know you uh, you kill one, he was talking about Jesus killing Jesus, and it, he was kind of telling them that it would be a mistake, you know. Or, you remember how that verse goes, Jesse? Yeah, it, it goes something like, uh, you know, if, if if you if you oppose this group of Christians. Uh, you could, and, and if it's, a, if it's not of God, yes. it'll die away. Yeah. Don't worry about it. But it, it, but if their movement, these new, these Christians, these apostles, if it is of God, you could find yourself Pharisees and Sadducees.
fighting against the living God himself. Mm -hmm. If their movement is of God. If it's not of God, Gamaliel says, don't worry, it's going to blow away like the wind. So Cyrus, you know, this movement was of God. God generated it, so he was successful. And uh, later on in our show, we're going to be talking about another person who who's, was successful in, um, and who was also a pagan. And uh, Well, let's jump into it right now, Ruben. Let's just introduce it. Yeah. Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great. Uh, yep. Okay. Go, go ahead. ahead. Knock it. Nope. Go. Yeah, go ahead. from you the new Constantine. Ruben, is he? Yeah, I think he is, man. I really do. Go, But um, you go ahead, Jess. I haven't brought okay. it up yet. So our, our religious freedom has been under attack for years. We all know that. Society is materialistic and immoral. Nobody doubts that. Western civilizations are facing huge threats from within and without. And uh, apparently the one powerful emerging leader, Donald Trump, he's not a saint. But I could tell you one thing. He sounds to me like the new Constantine. If if uh, if you're thinking, now this is an older article, but it still applies. If you're thinking about America back in 2016 when he won the election, of what I just described, no, I'm describing pagan Rome in 312 A.D. A religious freedom under attack, materialistic society, and immoral society, huge threats from within and without. That was pagan Rome in 312. Sounds like the U.S. But the leader I'm talking about is Constantine, who was vying to become the Roman emperor. Constantine had many defects. He had multiple wives <clears throat> and even put one of them to death. Well, Donald Trump's never done that. He was extremely ambitious and was a ruthless general and politician. But the legend remains that he had a road to Damascus moment. He saw a vision of Christ and converted to Christianity. And he triumphed over his, his opponents and became, and became a great emperor of Rome. Constance, Constantine would go on to not only save the Roman Empire, but also liberate Catholic Christianity. He signed the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, giving the Christians the right to practice their faith and speak freely. And this was enough to allow the Christians to engage in the public sphere with freedom, thereby enabling them to spread the Christian message to the ends of the empire and Christianize the pagan culture. Sounds exactly what like Trump's done. That's right. Constantine was no pillar of virtue, but he created an environment which gave Christians the influence, the freedom to influence society. Sounds like exactly what Donald Trump has been doing in his presidency. Ruben? Hey, man. <clears throat> when we come back, we're going to finish up this article. We're going to also talk about a couple other things. I'll play a clip for you. You're going to be uh, wanting to hear. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year round. May God bless you and your family. I'm Jonathan Rumi, and I play Jesus Christ in The Last Days, The Passion and Death of Jesus the Christ. This Lent, I'd love to invite you to join me and my co-director Maria Vargo for a very special live stream broadcast of this production. Beginning Palm Sunday, April 5th, and Holy Thursday, April 9th at noon Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern Time, you'll be able to watch the full program free on our Facebook page or on our website. To watch us on Facebook, go to facebook.com forward slash the last days of Jesus Passion Play or on our website at www.thelastdayspassionplay.com. While Christians around the world are unable to go to church during Holy Week, we are grateful to be able to bring this beautiful and reverent depiction of Christ's love and sacrifice for all into your homes. I pray you join us and have a blessed Easter. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we're back talking about uh, asking the question, is Trump the new Constantine? We're Constantine. I think we already established that he's the new Cyrus, the <laughs> Persian king, I'm convinced. Yeah, and just for those of you, you know, who... May not even know who Constantine was. He's that he was the the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. You know, he lived much of his life as a pagan and later as a catechumen. He joined the Christian religion on his deathbed, being baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia. He played an inf- influential role in the proclamation of the Edict of, of Milan in three thirteen. He declared tolerance for the Christian Christianity in the Roman Empire. He called the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which produced the statement of Christian belief known as the Nicene. God used him powerfully. Nicene Creed, yes. And then his mother, Helena, is credited with finding the true cross of, of Christ, the true cross Christian relic, reputedly the wood of the cross on which Jesus Christ was crucified. It was, it was found on her pilgrim, pilgrimage to the Holy Land about 326. And uh, Constantine had that, um, that vision. He was going into the Battle of Milvian Bridge, it took place between the Roman emperors Constantine the first and Maxentius uh, in three twelve, and um, it was it's that important route that bridge that goes over the Tiber River, and Constantine won the battle and started on the path that led him to to end the Tetrarchy and become the sole ruler of the Roman Empire, but uh, you know there's that uh, he had this vision that uh, it, it, he would his troops would go into battle with a uh, a, a sign. On their shields, it's it called. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. The Chiro. It's the first two yeah. letters of Christ's name in Greek, and it was painted, Cairo. I've heard it say Cairo. Cairo, oh, Cairo. Yeah, that makes sense. And and um, so it was painted on the shoulder shields. And and uh, later on, you know, after he was successful, you know, the the Arch of Constantine was erected in celebration of the victory. So that that goes. That's what uh, what Constantine was all about. So he, there was a lot uh, a lot. Writing on that battle, uh, obviously, God used him. And so going back to the article, so, uh, you said that, like you mentioned last last uh, segment, he was no pillar of virtue, and uh, but the early Christians were perfectly capable of influencing society themselves. All they needed from the emperor was the freedom to do so. And that's what Trump has done for us, Ruben, in the last four years. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he's he's made it. He's, he's made the environment now to the point where we can start asserting our Christian freedom. That's what he's done. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So fast forward to 2016, and uh, you know this is when Donald Trump was elected. We could see many obvious similarities. Western society has many problems. Conservative Christians have the solutions to many of those problems, but cannot articulate them freely in the public square due to the endemic political correctness and cultural Marxism. Conservatives do not lack will, good good arguments, or articulate defenders. What they lack is the freedom to speak bluntly about social issues without being shouted down by the vindictive hordes of secular progressivism for offending particular groups of people. And Donald Trump is the only person who can give us that freedom. And he has. Uh, and, you know, the liberal progressives, Jesse, were, they were in power during the last administration. They were taking away our religious freedom, our li- religious liberty. They wanted uh, to suppress the church's voice to speak out against same-sex marriage, against pro-death politicians, you know, claiming they would take away their um, tax-exempt status and and other things that were not congruent with the Catholic faith. It, so they were really making it hard for, um, you know, for us to— to speak freely about our faith, you know, and, and we'll, and we'll get into this. Consider, yeah. consider the following. Okay. These are, these are all things that I just was talking about. These stating are facts. These are facts. Stating that children should ideally have a mother and father because on average, they will do best in that environment as supported overwhelmingly by the relevant social science. 
renders you homophobic if you have that view, even though the statement has nothing to do with homosexuality and you're, quote, a hater of single mothers. Just you want to say the second one? Second bullet, explaining that there's actually a biological and societal reason that marriage has been promoted and protected as between a man and a woman for a thousand years. Hint, it's about children. If you say that, guess what? That makes you a bigot. Mm -hmm. Next bullet. Bullet three, arguing that the high divorce rate hurts children and that no-fault divorce is responsible for many social problems makes you, quote, living in the 50s and, um, and a dinosaur, end quote. Even though the social data on the effects of divorce is indisputable, and President Obama himself has said as much. Next bullet. Affirming the biological fact that men and women are inherently different makes you transphobic, something that no one knew existed just a few years ago. Yeah. And then lastly, pointing out that babies do not simply mag magically appear out of nothing after nine months and may in fact have a right to life and dignity before birth makes you an extremist just because, you know, and a sexist, even though... This statement has nothing to do with women. We're talking about the right to life. Yeah, there are many more examples. The point is that making perfectly reasonable statements causes so much outrage that conservatives either give up or end up losing credibility and becoming impotent in influencing public opinion. Arguments are not considered on their merits, but rather assessed based on the extent to which they offend particular groups of people. That's called political correctness run wild. And this makes the conservative Christian cause in the public sphere ultimately hopeless. And this is where President Donald Trump comes in. America doesn't need a president to make arguments for us. America just needs a president to give us the freedom to make our arguments without the fear of being shouted down by the politically correct brigade. And whatever else you may think about Trump, he is definitely politically incorrect. And he prides himself on that attribute. I love it. He refuses to back down after making controversial statements. He does not apologize for offending groups after making arguments. He stands up to the media. He is defiant in spite of being vilified by political elites, journalists, and academics. Ruben, you're going to say something? <laughs> no, I just was saying, hey, that's exactly, that was, that's Trump right there. I love that he's not politically correct, you know? He, he's a fighter. He fights back, man. You, you, he's a fighter like Constantine. He's a fighter like Cyrus the Persian. Yeah. He is. He's Let's not, consider the example yeah. of illegal immigration. Trump is tapping into the understandable tendency for ordinary citizens to be skeptical of high levels of immigration, especially when there's little or no order, or when there's, there is little or no order to the immigration program. So for many years, this was a no-go zone. As those who raised the issue were shouted down and, and, and called racist, and uh, there were allegations of you're, you're offending immigrants and you're offending Mexicans, etc. Trump, however, <clears throat> in a short time, has managed to kickstart a proper debate on the topic by refusing to be howled down and apologize for potentially offending minority groups. Regardless of your views on illegal immigration, it is clear that the tactics of the cultural Marxists used in the immigration debate simply do not work against Donald Trump. Ruben? You know, Jesse, so many politicians before Trump, Democratic politicians, by the way, Obama, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and, and Bill, um, were all touting, you know, build a wall, keep, you know, we have to have... Uh, you can watch them on YouTube. Yeah, you can. And so there's... They, 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 it makes me sick that they're... You know, the, the way they lambaste uh, Trump for taking that same position they held just a few years ago. And uh, so, you know, I think in their heart of hearts, they know the, the truth. They know that we have to have some borders. Otherwise, we would be a country. We have to have some kind of uh, vetting system or, or we wouldn't be a country. People can just march in. I, I, I really think in their heart of hearts, they know the right thing to do is to control who comes in and who goes. But the wrong guy is saying it. Exactly. That's, that's the whole point. If he would say one plus one is two, they'd say, no, it's not. Yeah. And it's not because it's not factually true. It's because he said it. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, you know, everything he's saying about the, the virus, you know, uh, they they go against him on it. You know, so a doctor says it and 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 then he, you know, Trump repeats it and they, they still still say Trump's wrong. So you take the issue of terrorism. Unlike many other Christian leaders, Trump calls out the evil of Islamic terrorism and extremism for what it is. And it seeks to sensibly scrutinize the policy of mass Islamic 
immigration in order to protect national security. In doing so, he's given he's again overcome the slogans of Islamophobia and racism to actually discuss an important sensitive issue. You know, when he was limiting, um, you know, uh, trans uh, lim- limiting uh, immigrants coming from certain certain countries to protect us from this, people were just bashing him. Uh, that's that's insensitive. It's a you know, it's Islamophobe and and all these things. And and he was the one who was he was unlike uh, Obama was was saying what calling these uh, the ISIS you know extremism uh, Islamic extremism you know and 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 that wouldn't um, you would never hear that from the the last administration you would never right. call radical Islamic <laughs> uh, extremism and um, so Christian conservatives need exactly the same thing to happen with other issues like abortion and marriage this is how Trump could be a great president for conservative Christians. Trump is the one president candidate, presidential candidate who's capable of changing society to make it more tolerant or of robust discussions on controversial issues. At last, with a leader who publicly holds the silencing tactics of the left with utter contempt, it would be possible to stand up to the leftists on hot bus button issues. Uh, and if, now that P- President Trump is the president and the most powerful leader in the West, he can fundamentally, and I think he is fundamentally changing Western culture for the good. The effects of his presidency would go far beyond the shores and walls of America. People now could speak freely about a range of issues. Political correctness, after being denounced by Trump over and over again, has been severely weakened. Cultural Marxism and the politics of victimhood uh, can, are being crippled. I think that's why this Wuhan virus is being weaponized against him. And as more information comes out, we'll be putting out more information. But I see something nefarious behind this. Oh, yeah, me too. And Yeah. Progressives who seek to shut down debate, they also realize that because of Trump, their tactics don't work no more. He just calls them fake news all the all, yeah. all the time. When he's doing his press conferences, he points, no, you're fake news. Uh, ne- oh, you're yeah. fake news. I love it, Ruben. I, <laughs> I love that. I do. A- and following this, he's fundamentally transforming the political scene. And conservatives, they're finally growing a spine because of him. They could finally be free to make their case in the public sphere. And everything else would follow from this. Our universities can become places of learning and free thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, as a result of Trump, we're getting better judges and lawyers and, and politicians as a result. And the population is becoming more informed about public debates, about our fake news. And uh, I think there's a lot of long-term successes that he's brought to us in four years. Uh, he's moving in the right direction on uh, those culture of death issues. Uh, by putting uh, Supreme Court justices that are conservative and uh, constitutional. We'll be right back. Jesus 911, don't change that dial. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church, to aid and defend her.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, where iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. We're we're, uh, talking about Trump as the new Constantine, perhaps. And uh, so many conservative Christian commentators and academics have spoken out against Trump, you know, for example, a large group of Catholic academics and public intellectuals, including Professor Robert George from Princeton, came out recently with many criticisms uh, criticisms of Trump. All of them understandable, many of them justifiable, some of them indisputable. It is perfectly legitimate to be concerned about Trump's sudden change of heart on abortion, his past comments on marriage, and uh, and the family. And um, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, you're there. Yeah, go ahead, Jess. I lost my place. Yeah, his his attitude towards Muslims, his support for torture, and so on. Yeah, but people such as Professor George, that are intellectual giants and have been great warriors for conservatism, but they appear to be missing the bigger picture of this election. Of course, this is back in 2016. They want to elect candidates who have a record of defending conservative positions as a way of mitigating the control that progressives have over social debates, a reality that they just accept. But why do we have to accept it? Why can't we think outside the square and elect someone who might be able to deal a fatal blow to political correctness and cultural Marxism? And that's exactly what we've gotten with Donald Trump, by the way. Having a consistent conservative president of the U.S., without a doubt, would be a welcome event. Publicly making the case for a number of Christian causes and nominating sound judges, which he's been doing, by the way, for instance, would be a good result, would be a good result in and of itself. However, there's a very limited amount of good this would do when there's still a culture that severely restricts public debate, particularly a number of vital social issues. And here's where Trump, Ruben, has uh, been phenomenal because, again, he looks at the media, all the cameras of the world are looking at him, and he says, you guys are fake news, next question. Nobody has ever had that, that type of gravitas to stand up to the illiberal elites like Donald Trump and he's given people courage now that people are podcasting, people are doing radio shows, people are blogging courageously yeah. with fortitude as a result of Trump's leadership. Bush wouldn't have done that. Come on, let's just be honest. No. Uh, you know, uh, Bush or Reagan didn't have the, the what I would call the gravitas that Donald Trump does. No. And, and, and the fact is, he's pushing back on this cultural Marxism and political correctness more than any other president in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Here's one, one uh, par- a sentence in the paragraph that really says it all. It says this, quote, Here again is a similarity with Constantine as emperor. He was such an egotistical individual that he even named the capital of the empire Constantinople after himself. Even, even Trump wouldn't go this far, probably. But he says, like Constantine, Trump is an imperfect human and flawed leader. But just as Constantine is now widely referred to as Constantine the Great for his achievements as Roman emperor and giving freedom to Christians, is it possible that one day Trump may be remembered as the man who made America great again and revered by Christians as the great? Ruben, I think it's possible. I think so, too, Jess. And, uh, you know, what That's why think? I wrote this book, by the way. Yeah. Wrote, see, he Trump a said Catholic that, vote for Trump. It's right here. You can see it, Ruben. He, Ruben, is it a good read? It's a good read, man. I really am right. enjoying it. There you it. go. My yeah. partner says it's a good read. You got Father Pavone giving you right in the intro already. He gave know, a pretty forward. powerful intro, huh? Yes, he does. And so, um, it's it's uh it's your hope, huh, that he's going to be able to Father Pavone's going to be able to give that book to uh, to President Trump. Yes, sir. That's the goal. I, I mean, I'd like to see President Trump convert to Catholicism within the oh, next course, four years. Amen. You know, that would be great. His wife's Catholic, and and Ruben, there's something we know. We're going to play a video. I don't know if we're going to yeah, still play uh, it. We're going to go ahead. Let me just set it up for you. Okay, there's there's a, a video on YouTube, and I uh, if you go to our show page, you'll see the link that I attached to it. 
it's a priest who's giving it. Uh, he's just telling about a, a friend of his named Claude Curran, who's a doctor that uh, told uh, the priest that when he goes to uh, to Italy to go to the you know, go to Loreto. You know, Loreto is that place where the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, was born in Nazareth. That house was transported by angels, so the Muslims wouldn't de- uh, destroy it. And it's there in Loreto, and this. Uh, a hermit, American guy. He went up there to be a hermit and work around the the church, the the basilica, and and around the house. He's his name. His name is Tom Zimmer. He's the one who put together a little prayer book called the Pieta. The, every, you know, it's sold like ten million copies. It's a, almost everybody I know has a copy of that Pieta. Well, that's the best selling Catholic prayer book. So Father talks about this conversation he had with uh, Tom Zimmer, but also Claude Curran tells him. Hey, you got to know this about Tom Zimmer. And so we're going to play this clip, and it's the last two minutes of it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Engineer. Happened between Tom and I in the 1980s. Dr. Curran said that in the 1980s, he was talking to Tom Zimmer. And Tom Zimmer said to him, Claude, there's a man right now who I believe in the future is going to lead America back to God. So... Claudio said, you know, who is this? You know, who is this, this guy? And Tom Zimmer said, the man who's going to, in the future, lead our country back to God is Donald J. Trump. And Dr. Curran said, you mean the New York playboy? Like, this is the guy? And Tom Zimmer said, believe me, I have a premonition that that this is the man who's going to do it in the future. So what Thomas did is at that time, John Paul II opened the holy doors of the Vatican, of St. Peter's Basilica. And when he opened the holy doors uh, for that year, it was for the whole year, when the doors are ready to close, the Vatican allows people to donate bricks that go inside the door, and you can put an inscription on the bricks of any intention you want, and those doors are closed and they're sealed, and they're not open until the next time the, the Vatican, the Pope decides to open the doors for another holy year. So uh, they, they're, they're shut sealed and all of the intentions that are on those bricks are prayed uh, during the holy sacrifice of the Mass at the Vatican, at, at St. Peter's. All the Masses that the Pope says, all the prayers that are prayed are all for the intentions of the inscriptions that are on these bricks. Tom Zimmer in the 1980s donated a brick to be put in the holy door of the Vatican that said Donald J. Trump. And he did that because he wanted those masses in the Vatican to be said for him because he knew that in the future this man was going to be a great leader of America and bring Americans back to God. Mm-hmm. And look at just yesterday at, his, at Donald Trump's rally, his wife prayed the Allah Father in front of the whole crowd it was just so moving and beautiful to hear a First Lady pray the Our Father. This premonition, I firmly believe that Tom Zimmer, this very holy hermit of Loretto, uh, a, a promise would happen, has been fulfilled. Very good. There you have it. So, you know, uh, this happened in the 80s. I mean... You can't make this stuff up, Jesse. And a lot of people don't know about that, you know, about that. The, the 1955 Holy Week. It's awesome. Yeah. It, not a lot of people uh, don't know about the brick in the the bricks in the the holy doors. But all those masses, all those prayers. Every day, attention. Ruben, every day Donald Trump is being prayed for, whether he knows it or not, by the most powerful prayer on planet Earth, the holy sacrifice of the mass coming from St. Peter's. Quarters. Yes. St. <laughs> Peter's. You think that's not going to have an effect on his soul, on his Presbyterian soul? Of course it is. Those are the graces. Those are the infinite graces of Calvary that are being projected into this man's soul since, what, 1980? Yes. Uh, this all makes sense, Ruben, the way he's governing, the way he's, the way he's moved towards Christianity and conservative thought and traditional thought and praying every day in the White House. It all makes sense. Yeah. He's being blasted by, by by the graces coming from the mass in the Vatican. And, and you know, he, uh, I think, he, he, even 
even the Vatican has is opposed to him. You know, uh, they had Bet Peter Saxon there talking about the one world order and that the the problem. Oh, yeah. oh, the yeah. problem yeah. we have is is our country, our President Trump. He's he's stopping this this globalism that they all Jeffrey want. Sachs. Yeah, it was. Yeah, they they want to they want to promote uh, gl- climate climate change. You know, global warming. Population globalists control. are very friendly with Pope Francis. Just let's put it out there. Yeah. So the population control is a big issue with them, and and everybody's on board. You know, he 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 took the U.S. out of some of those uh, those agreements, those treaties out there that that didn't didn't make any sense for the U.S. to be involved in those. So they oppose him like no other. Just and um, he says he's not. He says that they're not coming after me, man. They're coming after you, after your guns, uh, uh, after your religious freedom. Uh, I'm just the one that's in the way. I think you even me- right. mentioned that in your book, Jesse. You know, I'm just the one that's in the way. So, you know, it, without him, kind of run, running interference, it's like that fullback in a football team where he, you know, he's blocking for his tailback and making holes for him. This is Trump is doing that, making holes for us, making holes for conservatism. And we have and, to take advantage of that, Ruben. Absolutely. Restoring Western culture, Western society. And uh, we've had shows on that, you know, what what we need to do. Now in colleges, uh, more and more uh, conservative students are, are, are being able to have a voice, you know, because they've been silenced for so long, you know. And I know what it's like to be. Yeah, Ruben, under, under Trump, you got these not- movements like Candace Owens and. Charlie Kirk, they've got Turning Point and, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro. They, these young conservative thinkers are going into colleges now. And uh, Trump has already said, if, he, if these people get attacked, guess what? I'm, I'm pulling away all your federal funding. Good. Guess what? They're not being attacked no more. <laughs> Under President Obama, uh, they, they would all go there and there was riots and they would be physically attacked. There had to be police that would have to escort them out. Yeah. Trump says anybody attacks a, a conservative speaker going into college, guess what? Federal funding gone. What happened? Very interesting. Nobody's being attacked in colleges no more. Hmm. Yeah. I know what's interesting is that if uh, he if he calls it, it says that this is a, a, a nationwide emergency and he can suspend the election, it's quite possible that he would just automatically run and be president for the next I four years. I hope he does that. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And that would put it into this uh, this virus real quick. How huh? when the Democrats they if he, they hear him doing that, <laughs> yeah. 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 Ruben, I'll tell you one thing. And just I said it before, uh, the people say, but he's a flawed individual. I'm saying, look at the mirror. The fact is, Ruben, there are no perfect candidates, and uh, the reason there's no perfect candidate is because the perfect candidates exist in heaven. Yeah, they're called Jesus and Mary, the Son of God and His Mother. And they're not running for office. But the fact of the matter is, I, I, I sleep good at night and I feel a lot safer knowing that we have this man in the White House right now. He's got our back, Ruben. He's got our six. That's right. People say, hey, the Catholic Church is flawed. got a lot of sinners in it. I'm going to go find another church. There's no perfect church out there, you know. And uh, you went to and if go you join it, it up, it's going to be it's going to be messed up because you joined it. That's right. That's right. You joined that church. You're a sinner. You're going to make it. And you just imperfect. messed it up. <laughs> You have been listening to Jesus 911. We are now 107. We're uh, going to go off and uh, and do some uh, some holy holy work. And I know holy apostolic know, work. We're going to going to be praying for our listeners. You do uh, hopefully you do the same for us. And stay tuned for hands on apologetics with Gary Mashuda, and uh, we'll be with you tomorrow. Same bat channel, same Christ channel, same Christ station. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.
Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity.